Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this discussion on small states at the United Nations, co-sponsored by IPI and the permanent mission of New Zealand to the UN. This event is part of a joint research project between IPI and New Zealand on the strengths and challenges of small state diplomacy, and it marks the publication of a new policy paper entitled Small States at the United Nations, Diverse Perspectives, Shared Opportunities, authored by IPI policy analyst Andrea O'Sullivan. The paper is quite literally hot off the presses today, and I read a final draft over the weekend, and let me just say it is a model of what good policy research ought to be. Uh, thoroughly researched, fairly argued, clearly presented, and fully accessible to those who may want to make use of it to fashion smart policy. Now, I'm in a privileged position here because I can claim major responsibility for this project and this publication from start to finish without having had to do any of the hard work to produce it. Two years ago or so, I had lunch with Jim McClay, the ambassador of New Zealand, and he told me at lunch about the idea of fostering a study of small state diplomacy at the UN, and he asked if IPI would be interested in collaborating on it. Uh, I brought the idea back to Francesco Mancini, IPI's director of research, who put it into motion, working closely with Anthony Simpson, first secretary at the New Zealand mission. Francesco, by the way, would be here today, except he's in our Vienna office, where we're holding our annual Vienna seminar. About the same time as that lunch, I went to a gathering of newspaper editors and correspondents at the Metropolitan Museum. And I saw an old friend of mine from my New York Times days who had been the editor of the Boston Globe. Uh, and he said, so what are you up to? And I told him about IPI and what we do here. And I said to him, what are you up to? And he told me about some work he was doing at Notre Dame University. And by the way, he said, I know a talented young woman there who might be useful in the work you have just described. That young woman, of course, turned out to be Andrea O'Sullivan, the author of this new report. And now you see how my responsibility for all of this was accumulating. The only thing remaining to round out my involvement was in hosting today's meeting, which I'm very happy to do, and in keeping with the way I have fully delegated authority in this since the beginning, I'm going to let the people who really thought it up, worked on it, and produced these impressive results tell you all about it. You have their full biographies in your papers, so let me introduce them just briefly in the order in which they will speak. Jim McClay has been the permanent representative of New Zealand since June of 2009, when he added diplomacy to what was already an impressive and broad record of achievement at home in parliamentary politics and the law. Andrea O'Sullivan is a policy analyst at IPI, and among her many projects here, she's currently researching the roles of women in civil society in peace processes and the long-term benefits of inclusive mediation. In that pursuit, by the way, and in this one, she has worked in close collaboration with our associate editor, Marie O'Reilly. Heidi Schroeder as Fox is the director of the United Nations Office of the High Representative for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing States. We consider Heidi an old friend of IPI also, since we often collaborate with the mission of Finland, where prior to taking up her present post in July 2012, she was the deputy permanent representative. Jim, I am so pleased, first of all, that you brought this project to IPI, and secondly, that you were here to start us off today. I do distinctly remember that lunch. What I didn't tell you was that uh, before inviting you to join me and to listen to the idea that I wanted to broach, I'd made some very wide consultations as to the most appropriate organization to undertake the research. And the unanimous view was IPI. IPI had the 
intellectual grunt, it had the UN connections, it had the understanding of the environment, it was the appropriate body, and this report, I believe, confirms that judgment. Can I, can I thank you all for joining us today for the official launch of what has been, for me personally, a very strong interest for the past 18 months. <clears throat> Some of you here today have actually contributed actively to the project. Others participated in last week's soft launch with the Forum of Small States. But if you're hearing about it for the first time, let me give you some background about the, its inspiration and, and, and its purpose. Uh, for those of us who come to the UN for the first time, this can be a bewildering and indeed an intimidating place. Uh, the range of issues and meetings seems beyond what you could ever expect to cover, even with an army of diplomats, and the rules and procedures are opaque and they are confusing. That was certainly the case for me when I arrived here five years ago. In my first months, it felt at times like I was navigating in a darkened room with black furniture and the lights off. I was lucky to have a small but experienced team in my mission. Uh, but not all are so fortunate, especially for, and that's especially true for very small states who may have as few as two, two diplomats and for whom any staff turnover means real loss of knowledge and experience. Many, many false small states, and we, we take here the World Bank's definition of less than 10, a population of less than 10 million, were not even in being in their present uh, independent form when the UN Charter was signed in, in 1945. But since then, we have become a very healthy majority at the United Nations more than 55% of its total membership. Most small states don't need any convincing of the vital importance of the UN and of a rules-based international or multilateral system. We've consistently, as small states, been its strongest supporters. Small states know that fair, objectively applied global norms represent the best prospects for, for protecting and advancing our interests and for protecting our sovereignty. And we know that the principles of the UN Charter, sovereign equality, collective security, and the peaceful settlement of disputes, are more fundamental for our sovereignty and to our security than they might be for our other larger and potentially more powerful states. So it's no surprise that the small states have a very proud record at the United Nations, a, a record of really making a difference as negotiators, as peacekeepers, and as thought leaders. There would today be no ATT if it wasn't for Costa Rica. There would be no ICC without Trinidad and Tobago. And it's very, it's almost impossible to overstate the contributions made by countries like Singapore, Jamaica, Malta, and Fiji, and indeed, and indeed New Zealand, in the negotiations that led to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. My country, for one, has never accepted that its size should relegate us to a lesser role on the international stage. Whether it be in our 1945 efforts to, to oppose the, uh, the P5 veto, and to champion the rights of self-determination and the centrality of, of development issues, or, or our stand for responsible United, Na United Nations Security Council responses in Somalia, Rwanda, and Bosnia-Herzegovina in the 1990s. But all that said, small states really do face enormous challenges in making their voices heard at the UN. Our diplomatic resources here and, and in capitals, for that matter, are often very limited. The relative costs of our UN engagement are higher, our compliance burdens are heavier, and our ability to access and to absorb and do something with vital information really can be quite limited. So the purpose of this project was to drill down deeper into all of those challenges and basically with a view to identifying practical steps that might help small states to make their voices heard at the UN. And it did so by drawing on the knowledge and the experience and the ingenuity of small states themselves. About 60 small states contributed either in interviews or in ambassadorial round tables. And the fruits of all of that effort are to be found in this document. 
The report highlights the challenges faced by small states in three key areas, access to information, capacity building, and small state engagement with the UN Secretariat. And it makes recommendations for practical steps, and please I underline the word practical steps, to make, uh, to, to, to make the UN an easier place for small states to operate. Now, in a moment, you're going to hear in, uh, about all that in more detail from IPI, but I just want to highlight a few points. First, the report doesn't paper over the diversity between small states in terms of their circumstances, their interests, their policies, and their resources. Small states can be found in virtually every one of the UN's and in the international community's groupings. They can, be, they can be G77, they can be NAM, they can be EU, they can be NATO, they can be, um, they can be a whole range of, of groups, they can be, be AOSIS, and I could just go on and on with, with examples of the entities and the blocks and the interests and the policy groups which small state, in which small states participate. So we don't pretend that those differences don't exist. On the contrary, we should be celebrating them as, a, as an indication that the United Nations is the right place for, for us to broach those issues. Small states reflect the overall diversity of the United Nations itself. And the report doesn't advocate any form of policy alliance or policy grouping itself. Instead, it focuses on their perspectives and their interests and those that are most closely aligned, specifically addressing structural and capacity barriers to their effective participation at the United Nations. Secondly, although the recommendations disproportionately benefit small states, and given that our needs have been largely ignored for the last 69 years, I don't make any apology for that, these aren't at the expense of larger countries. Indeed, there are potential benefits for all member states regardless of size, to be found in all of these recommendations. And that's especially true in respect of information sharing and streamlined UN processes. I can't imagine any country, large or small, that wouldn't welcome those features, information sharing and streamlined processes. Can you believe that we still walk down to First Avenue, line up outside the pass office to get a, a UN pass, when you can get your driver's license online. Now, it just doesn't make any sense to me, but we all accept it and we all do it, rain or shine, summer or winter, lined up down there getting our passes. Thirdly, the report doesn't portray small states as passive victims, but rather it celebrates their resilience and their ingenuity in overcoming the inherent challenges that they face at the UN and indeed elsewhere. In the words of New Zealand's indigenous Māori, heiti heiti kaiakatoa. The kaiakatoa tree may be small, but it is strong and it is resilient. And so the report identifies strategies that might be used by small states, including cooperation and burden sharing, prioritization uh, and long-term planning, investment in mission personnel, and innovative approaches to leveraging UN engagement and supplementing UN mission capacities. I'd also emphasize um, the uh, vital role of peer support, particularly between small states, through sharing information and experiences and by building core capacities. We already do this to a certain extent. We just exchange information casually between experts, between ambassadors, but it's casual, it's, it's disorganized, it isn't, it isn't done on, on any formalised basis. Uh, uh, indeed, I, I think I would be inclined on this occasion, bearing in mind that there are a number of member states here, including some that aren't in the category of small states, I would challenge all states at the United Nations, large and small, to consider what they can do to support their smaller neighbours, whether it be through sharing information or policy, or with administrative tools or by targeted capacity building, interns, for example. Finally, there are some areas where your feedback would be really welcome, uh, specifically on how we translate these ideas into practical action, because as far as I'm concerned, this is not the end. This is the beginning of the next stage. It's what we do in practice with this report that will really prove its value or otherwise. With regard to, the timely with to more timely access to focused 
and reliable information, I'd welcome your thoughts on how we could make more systematic use of social media. We were very proud of ourselves when my first year here that we used Twitter because, uh, uh, more correctly, our, our rapporteur in the third committee uh, used Twitter as a means of communication and to get her information back and forth between herself and those with whom she was most closely working. So we want to look at what's already available in terms of social media, whether it be Twitter or WhatsApp, and the more customised tools such as IDNet, which is actually created by small states, led by Malta, right here at the UN and intended for UN use and purposes. I would also welcome some feedback on, policy, on the policy briefings that we've been running for small states on the work of the SDGs Open Working Group, uh, how they might be improved, whether they have been of benefit, and other areas, that, and, and perhaps to identify other areas where we might also conduct the same sort of briefing sessions. And I'd certainly welcome comments on the proposals in the report to use interns and secondments to grow the capacities of individual small missions. Uh, I'd also like to hear what you think about the suggested how-to guides on basic UN activities, how to book a room, how to run a resolution. Uh, you can imagine a couple of very useful pages on both of those alone. And uh, possibly about uh, the ideas that are contained in the report about reducing overheads through initiatives like the Commonwealth Small States Office that's to be found in both uh, New York and Geneva. And I would definitely like to hear your thoughts on the report's list of specific asks we might put to the UN Secretariat to make the UN an easier place for small states, and indeed for others, to operate in. And the idea of a high-level champion for those that cause within the Secretariat. When I launched this project in March of last year, Warren, I stressed that the key powers which small states can harness to overcome their limitations of size and capacity were very impressive indeed. The power of our numbers, 55% of the UN's membership. The power of our partnerships and the simple fact that we come together in a group like an occasion like this, or as we did last week in the FOSS, the power of our partnerships and the transformative power of good ideas. Think UNCLOS, think ATT, think um, ICC. All things that came about because of the initiatives of small states. So can I repeat again, the power of our numbers, the power of our partnerships, and the power of our good ideas. Th through this project, I've got to tell you, through this project, it's, it's been an enormous privilege to witness all those powers being harnessed in, in a truly positive manner. Every meeting we had, every round table we had, was positive and forward-looking and outward-looking. There was no sorry us, there was no victim us, there was all, it was all about how we can be more effective. And so I look for, forward now to your thoughts on how best we can translate the report and its recommendations into better outcomes at the UN as a whole. To do that for the UN as a whole, but above all, to do it for the majority of members who are small states without whom they, this place could not properly ever be called a United Nations. Thank you, Jim. Uh, by the way, um, in response to Jim's plea for suggestions, reactions, I know he means beyond this meeting, but we will have a question and answer period immediately following him, and I urge you at that point to, uh, to make some of those comments and suggestions and questions. Now, um, I'm going to keep going here, turn to the author uh, of the report that Jim has been talking about, Andrea. Thank you, Warren, and thank you, Ambassador McClay, for starting us out, I think, with a great um, set of remarks on the contributions and experience of small states at the UN. As already pointed out, this research project and this report has really been based on the ideas and insights of small states themselves. Today, I want to quickly outline the consultation process that drove this research, the findings of small, straight, small state strengths and their shared characteristics, the central challenges that small states face in their UN engagement, and finally, some of the practical options for moving this forward. 
As has been said, started in early 2013, we began conducting interviews. We did 20 individual interviews with permanent representatives and deputy permanent representatives in small state missions. Then last year, between March and December, we held four roundtables in partnership with New Zealand to collect feedback on research briefs and possible recommendations that we were already drafting and circulating among small states. So in total, we counted 54 small states who we benefited from their contributions of insights and opinions. Also, we were able to present the project, its mission and preliminary findings at meetings of the FOSS, which has been mentioned for the uninitiated here, the Forum of Small States. And that's been around as an informal group for over 20 years here in New York and has 105 members. So again, we see that that's a majority of the UN's membership and a significant group. So we heard reactions there from even more states in the FOSS meetings, and last week we presented the final draft of this report there with more ambassadors who had contributed to the research. And when we started out, we really started from scratch. There's not so much existing research in this area. There are several very good papers out there, but it's not a large area of literature. So we started from scratch and said, what are the key strengths and what are the key challenges of being a small state at the UN? And throughout those conversations, many ambassadors really agreed on these strengths and shared perspectives. First is that small states often excel in multilateralism. International platforms like the UN can provide small states the opportunity to play a role in global affairs that is disproportionate to their size. In turn, small states value multilateralism as they recognize it's their opportunity to have their voice heard in world affairs. So it definitely has benefits in both directions. Second, and very related to that, small states prioritize international cooperation. Again, the international system and the principle of sovereign equality safeguards the voices of small states. But as our ambassadors have also noted, more work is needed to make sure that the rules and procedures of the international system and the UN are suited to the needs of small states. Third, and this is a very interesting part of the research, is that the presence here at the UN offers great value to small states. We found that for many, their missions here in New York could be called their mission to the world, through which they carry out not just diplomacy within UN meetings, but also a great deal of bilateral diplomacy. Um, it was very interesting to speak to ambassadors who carry out more diplomacy, say, from North to South Africa here in New York than happens on that continent. We kept hearing that these meetings happen over and over here. So this is very cost effective. It saves nations having to operate and maintain embassies in as many countries around the world. But of course, this only adds to the capacity challenges that small missions here face. Um, also, it's outlined in the report a bit, but it was interesting to actually visit a lot of these missions and see you have some small state missions with upwards of 20 staff. You have others, which I was lucky to visit, which have maybe only two diplomats in the office. And so even within small states, there's this very large range of what is small, what is a capacity challenge. Um, also, just one quick note was that we, we met with ambassadors from some of the smallest states who are accredited to multiple postings. So they might be the ambassador to the UN here in New York, while concurrently serving as the ambassador to the US in DC, and even more postings than that. So you really start to get the sense of, we all know that the schedule of the UN in New York is incredibly hectic, and then you add more and more responsibilities to that. Another is that small states use coordination to overcome capacity challenges. Some of these groupings were already mentioned here and we outline those in the report. But across the board, we found that small states pool their resources, their information, they plan with each other on which states will cover which issues and which meetings, and this really helps them to have an effective presence. And finally, on the last strength I'll mention, though there's more in the report, um, small states tend to develop niche areas of expertise as prioritization is a very key strategy for small states, again, given the breadth of the UN agenda. So small states do best when they choose a limited scope of issues and re invest resources and personnel according to that priority. 
This can also help build what we've termed in the project small, small cooperation among small states. This is already happening and something that we recommend building on, exchanging different areas of expertise between small state missions and providing one another insider information on the issues that each small mission might follow closely. We also documented, again, small states' tendency to cooperate through multiple groupings. The report names and describes some of these, um, such as the Small Five Group and a newer group, the Accountability, Coherence, and Transparency, or ACT Group, the Alliance of Small Island States, CARICOM, the Pacific Small, small Island Developing States, and again, the, the history of the Forum of Small States with 20 years at the center of small state convening. And just to move on, based on the common perspectives of small state ambassadors, we identified three overarching areas of shared challenges. The first is what we called asymmetric access to information. This means that small states have this sort of paradoxical information asymmetry. At the same time that they're inundated with too much information to process and filter, which I think all of us, even outside of missions here in the UN community, can understand when you look at your inbox every morning, the number of updates and reports and meeting schedules. But simultaneously, small states lack access to crucial insider information at the UN. Second is capacity constraints. Limited resources and policy capacity can pose special challenges in complex processes like treaty implementation and treaty reporting, all of those obligations came up repeatedly throughout this project, running for elections, but also practical matters like intern recruitment and management, um, and things that I really didn't expect to discuss at length in this project, such as booking a room in the UN, even catering, um, and not having enough options for that in UN meetings, so these really basic day-to-day -day operational issues. Third, we discussed structural barriers to full participation at the UN. And this led to our discussion around services and service provision by the Secretariat and other parts of the UN system. So then we moved on and started to develop recommendations. And we came out with three very closely corresponding areas of information sharing, capacity building, and services from the UN system. These are detailed in the report, but I'll just very quickly summarize some of the possible options for future action in each area. First, we found that information sharing among states can ensure that small missions have the necessary information and tools to engage effectively at the UN. And again, not only greater sharing of information, but also of the expertise that each small state mission cultivates, and that this small, small cooperation is an important area. We talked again about information, and this was something that a lot of small state ambassadors said, we already have so much information. What we need now is information sharing with a purpose, a strategic exchange that could center on priority areas for certain missions, preparation for general assembly sessions, or learning more about the platforms of country candidates at the time of elections. Those are just a few examples where small state ambassadors said, here's a very specific area where we could actually benefit from targeted information. And again, the diversity issue came up here, where some ambassadors said, yes, we need information, but what information is needed really depends on that mission's priorities. So someone said, updates and briefs are a great idea, but on ECOSOC reform or on climate change, that really will depend on the mission's priority. Ambassadors largely agree that these following possible resources and tools for information sharing could be useful tools to look at in the future. The first would be to develop an online hub of practical tools and resources to facilitate access and exchange of information. We give some examples in the report of very specific tools, and one that's been mentioned is the International Diplomatic Network, or IDNet, which several small states actually have championed creating. Um, so that's one to look into more. Second, to organize tailored briefings for small states ahead of major UN meetings. Um, third, to engage the UN Secretariat on its provision of information to delegates. And of course, this overlaps with our third area on support from the UN system. 
Quickly now, second area is capacity building. We all know there's so many examples of training for junior and senior diplomats by many organizations, by the UN's own Institute for Training and Research, UNITAR. And while these are often extremely useful, their scope, their duration, and how they're delivered can raise challenges for the limited resources of small states. So it was agreed that there seems to be space to make these training opportunities more accessible for small state delegates. And small states indicated a desire to engage with UNITAR and other organizations on how to make these training courses that already exist and those that will be developed in the future more accessible and tailored to the special needs of small missions. We also discussed organizing orientation courses because the issue of ambassador turnover came up a lot when you have these small missions and there's not an extensive roster of diplomats, if the PR or the DPR changes, you tend to lose a lot of institutional knowledge. So developing very effective orientation courses came up. As was mentioned, developing short how-to guides on key UN activities. And again, this spanned technical and procedural matters, such as drafting and sponsoring resolutions, chairing UN meetings, but also these logistical matters of organizing events and booking rooms at the UN, planning and managing participation in Leaders Week, and recruiting and accommodating interns. There's additional new initiatives to consider outlined in the report. Finally, we turned to support from the UN system. And this was an area where small states representatives suggested a range of possible steps to address these structural barriers to participation. One option discussed at length was for the UN Secretariat to mainstream or consider small state proofing. We have uh, some other areas where we do this and consider throughout each decision, resolution, activity, um, making sure that this is in line with the needs of a certain constituency. So the idea of small state proofing emerged. Ambassadors discussed generating a list of specific requests for the Secretariat in this regard and culminating in this idea of a small state champion. Can we appoint a UN official or add to a high level official's roster of duties, um, considering and implementing these requests and monitoring progress and updating and engaging small states? So just to note on the final box in this report, which starts on page 15, there's a draft of a possible text that could be sent to the Secretariat with these requests. We've discussed this with small state ambassadors and the permanent mission of New Zealand put this together, so that's there. This discusses enhancing the accessibility of Secretariat personnel. Simple, again, just a better directory that's easier for people to access. Reviewing core services provided, and again, streamlining information on key UN processes. So just to conclude, it's important to note again that while these recommendations were formulated with the needs of small states in mind, these are issues that add burdens to the UN engagement of all states. So the recommendations outlined here could really benefit all member states' engagement at the UN regardless of size. Um, it's been a real privilege to work with so many small states on this research, and I also look forward to discussing the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, you know, I thought as you were talking, I know you were, there's so much detail on that report, you had to sweat it down. There's one small detail that was really struck me, and, and you got close to it there, uh, talking about capacity building. Many small state ambassadors, you know, are sometimes accredited to three or four or five different countries in addition to the UN, to the, to the US, to a Caribbean nation, to Canada. Uh, there's yet another strain on there, and I just thought that was a very significant detail in the report. Um, now, um, uh, a view from the UN itself, and also Heidi has promised me a bit of a personal view. She'll take her UN hat off at one point and speak about um, small states. Uh, Heidi Shorters Fox, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Permanent Mission of New Zealand and Amb Ambassador McClay. Uh, thank you for IPI for convening this very important gathering. And, uh, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I, I will try to do a little bit of both uh, the UN perspective as well as the personal uh, perspective. Meeting, of course, uh, of this kind, as well as the Forum of Small States, as well as the Alliance of, of Small Island States, they are really very, very important in, in making sure that the voices of small states can be magnified by, by working together on, on many of the UN issues. 
So my work right now as the director, uh, I think I have the longest title in the UN. It's the director for the uh, Office of the High Representative for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked I, I didn't even states. venture trying to pronounce that acronym. And Small Island de Developing State, it's O-H-R-L-L-S. Um, but many of these countries that my office represent, many of them are also uh, small states. And uh, so therefore, I will talk a little bit about their perspectives, uh, in particular of SIDS, and then I will take off my UN hat and talk about my work as, uh, uh, as Finland or a diplomat for Finland. So the challenges of the small states uh, within my constituency of those, uh, those groups, which is more than um, 100 UN member states, they are often very, very complex uh, nature. Distinguishing factors uh, include difficulty in gaining economies of scale, a heavy reliance on few commodities that are often prone to external shocks, also limited natural resources, exposure to high levels of risk due to small populations and limited space, also brain drain due to lack of employment opportunities, distance, long distance from world markets and so on. These are all very uh, difficult issues for many of the developing uh, small states. Many small states are also located in hazard prone areas and that can experience devastating disasters. One a uh, cyclone or tsunami can really, has, has the potential to wipe off several years, or if not decades, of development gains that have been made. Despite the challenges of smallness, small state at the United Nations have demonstrated very strong leadership in bringing about big ideas and really tangible strain, uh, change within the UN. Small states are among the pioneers and leaders on many of the global issues. Uh, I think uh, both of the previous uh, speakers have already talked about this. I have my list was very similar. Arms Race Treaty, uh, Convention of the Law of the Sea, um, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, ICC, and also Security Council reform. I don't know that we have made a, a whole lot of progress in that, but still the leaders of, of the discussion have very often been small states, and uh, they have really put a lot of uh, effort into moving these things forward. Um, many of the developing small states don't want to see themselves as re just recipients of ODA, but also as equal partners and very effective stakeholders on issues of common interest. Furthermore, uh, recognizing the inherent similarities of the challenges they face, small states are increasingly collaborating amongst themselves on, on sharing best practices and lessons learned on variety of issues and strengthening their regional institutions and cooperation. So I'll, I'll just mention very briefly uh, three important events this year because 2014 is a very important uh, year for, for my office. We will have, um, in July, the Benin Conference on Productive Capacity Building for LDCs. This is a very important uh, meeting for all the LDCs and the small LDC states. We will also have, in November, the um, United Nations Conference on Landlocked uh, Developing Countries. Uh, the landlocked countries are really among the poorest and most marginalized uh, um, in global economy, and they are setting up their new development agenda for the next decade. Uh, in Vienna, so this is a very important event for them. And then, of course, uh, um, uh, this 2014 is a key year for the small island developing states. Uh, it's not only that the United Nations uh, General Assembly has designated 2014 as the International Year of Small Island Developing States, and this is actually the first group of countries to be recognized in such a way. But also, of course, from the 1st to the 4th of September, Samoa will host the third international conference on small island developing states. And as we look forward to Samoa, it is important uh, that the outcomes of the conference addresses the challenges SIDS face in building the resilience of their societies, economies, and most importantly, um, uh, build the future and the well-being of the people. People are very much the greatest asset that the SIDS possess, and together with the international support and partnerships, 
investments are needed to fur further boost education and training and to achieve high rates of sustainable economic growth and job creation to address the issues of unemployment, in particular uh, youth, women, and so on. Despite limited national resources, SIDS have demonstrated very strong determination and leadership in calling for ambitious and urgent actions addressing their concerns, including uh, issues of connectivity and transport, renewable energy, access to technology, health of oceans, food security, um, non-communicable diseases, disaster risk reduction, and, and uh, ultimately the dire consequences of, of climate change. For instance, and I think this is a great example of what small uh, states can do um, together, in 2012, SIDS leaders in the Pacific agreed uh, on the Majuro Declaration, which, which captures the Pacific's political commitment to be a region of climate leaders with ambitious commitments to reduce emissions and to benefit from new, renewable, clean, and sustainable energy. Of course, the uh, permanent missions of the SIDS countries here are often very, very small. So I think that they are also a great example of what good teamwork can do. Um, Pacific Island uh, developing state, the PSIDS, and also the CARICOM very often work together in con common issues and update each other on, on recent activities uh, that other colleagues might have missed. So this is a very practical um, uh, thing that they do and, and that works very well. Building partnerships is, of course, a key theme for the summer conference. And, uh, of course, building partnerships is, in, in general, very important for all uh, small states. I think a great example of a very successful partnership is that of, of what New Zealand uh, is, is doing and its partner is commitment in partnering with the SIDS um, towards achieving their sustainable energy goals. This is a very, very good um, example of a very successful uh, partnership. But in closing, let me now um, take my hat, uh, my UN hat off and uh, reflect a little bit on my 20 plus years as a diplomat for a very small state, uh, Finland. Very early in my career, I was participating in an evening, uh, attending an evening event, and I was approached by a, a fellow diplomat from a very, very large uh, country. And I think he had had a couple of cocktails before that discussion. Um, as he approached me and he said, Finland, hmm, Finland, I really wonder how it is to work for a country like that. I cannot imagine working for a small country like that. I mean, who really cares about what Finland says? Does it really matter? And he was very earnest. He really meant it. And uh, I, of course, that was a little bit uh, offensive and certainly uh, arrogant, but I've come back to that uh, comment very often in my career and thought about it. You know, can small states, can Finland really be and make a difference in the big world arena? Can we do something? And after some 20 plus years, I can really strongly say that small countries can really make a big difference, in my opinion. First of all, small countries can be very succe successful and influential in diplomacy and world affairs, both in advancing certain critical issues or leading very difficult uh, multilateral negotiations or acting as mediators behind the scenes on, on very uh, difficult uh, issues. I think that the UN can testify to many of these successes of small state. Um, for a UN mission such as Finland, um, work always means prioritization, and that's very easy to say, prioritize. That's what we were always told. And we would always send back lists to the capital on an annual basis saying these are the top priorities and this is the second and these we deprioritize. And always we would get, they would get back to us and, oh, no, 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 you can't deprioritize because you need to and this is also important and so on. So prioritization is important, but it's not easy. Also, I would say, secondly, that smallness can also be an advantage. When, you, when I was sitting there in many of the negotiations at the UN, um, for example, on arms trade treaty or so on, I might have one expert from the defense ministry behind me. And I look at my colleague who comes from a very large country with 30 
different experts from different interagency. Uh, uh, uh. So decision making is much easier when you are small and you don't have this huge uh, number of different agencies. Uh, and also when you call back home to the foreign ministry in order to get some advice on certain issues, it is very likely that you know the person personally whom you're calling. It, it makes things easier and lighter. So yes, and then thirdly, partnering with the other like-minded, yes, that of course is very important, but that can also be complicated. Uh, if, I'm, if this is a very high priority country for me and I'm Finland and I want to make sure that somebody is listening to me, I might not want to partner with you because you also, uh, if you're like-minded, but you also want to have a high profile on this. So um, this, this is something that on high priority issues, you have to be active partnering with secondary interest or, or certainly, for example, in the fifth committee, I know many small countries are saying, you take this night, I will take the next night, and so on. Um, then relying on group support, I think, is also important. Regional, sub-regional groupings, uh, this kind of um, cooperation can be very uh, crucial for, for small states. And then um, fifth is using outside resources, such as academia, World Bank, NGOs. They can really provide substantive support on many of the key issues. If we look at the UN today and the kinds of negotiations we, ha we are having, talking about, for example, financing for development, we have so many different working groups and, and, and technical working groups and, and, and different things. The issues are so complicated. No country, big or small, but in particular the small ones, have the capacity of understanding all the technicalities of the issues that are there uh, uh, that they need to know. So my office has, uh, has done, uh, my present UN office, we are working very closely with some of our uh, countries, trying to help them to put them together with academia, put them together with the World Bank experts, and so on, so that they can have the best possible support on, on the technical issues um, that they need to be active and that are important. And finally, I come to the suggestions that you uh, talked about making a better connection between the UN Secretariat and the member states, and I could not agree more on that one. I think that there is a lot to be done there. And as I have looked at the, this from both the member state side and the Secretariat side, sometimes it's like a parallel universe. We are in the same meeting rooms, and we work together, but it doesn't really uh, work well together. You mentioned the very practical issue of the directory. When I first uh, joined the UN Secretariat and I looked at the directory and it had a couple of names, no, what are these people doing? How am I supposed to know if I'm a member state of, of whom to call if I want to discuss uh, climate change or so on. It is just a list of people and numbers. So there's a lot to be done linking the word work better of the member states and the secretariat. I would really uh, uh, want to see uh, uh, much more to be done on that. So maybe I will leave it at that and uh, thank you very much. Heidi, thank you very much. Um, all three of the panelists mentioned um, small island developing states. And before um, we go to the question and answer period, I want to call on the ambassador of one of those states, and that ambassador is Dr. Caleb Otto, the ambassador of Palau. Just take that microphone. There we go. Um, there isn't much I'm going to add to what's been said so eloquently by the panel, except to say that if you want a personification of the report, you're looking at him. <laughs> I'm very small in the sense of population. I'm probably the second smallest member state next to my friend from Tuvalu. Palau is, uh, has 20,000 people. We're small in the sense of being new. We're only 20 years old as a nation, and we've only been a member of the United Nations less than that. So we're also very new. My mission has two people, myself and the secretary. So we're also very small in that respect. So this report, I want to say thank you to Ambassador of New Zealand and to IPU for your foresight in um, coming up with a report that uh, will uh, help us in a, a very large sense. I have an issue with some of the things you said. 
in the sense that the using the World um, Bank definition of 1.5 million leaves so many of us behind. Of the 12 nations in the Pacific that are members, seven of us have population less than 100,000. So that's an important consideration, needs to be also considered. Um, thank you so much for all the recommendations. I won't say any more because they just say it right to the heart. I want to um, just read one of the statement that said, as they can work swiftly and more flexibly uh, than their larger counterparts saddled with extensive uh, domestic bureaucracies and change of command. That's already been said. Small states also prioritize issues strategically as their UN mission teams and foreign ministries are not large enough to cover the entire range of issues. We don't need to actually cover the entire range of issues. And I think that's one of the things that actually slows down our work because we tried to cover just so much. And that's the reason why there's a lesson, I think, from the small states in terms of prioritizing. And just like I said in our in intervention during the um, Security Council um, reform debates, that Palau in a million years will never be interested in becoming a member of the Security Council as a member because we'll never get there. That's not our aspiration. But we do have interest in the Security Council because very often, or during World War II, and very recent as last year, we almost became a victim of superpowers. When a big nation wanted to um, shoot missiles towards the uh, base in Guam, we were right next door. And who knows where those missiles would land. And also in the Second World War, we were right in between big nations, and we were victims of the war. So we have a vested interest in making sure that the Security Council works well, and we uh, hope that those who go into the Security Council can also advocate and work very hard on behalf of small islands, because very often we don't have much to say with regards to the Security Council. Your recommendations I take to heart. Thank you very much. I, if I could just um, put into practice some of those recommendations. And one of the recommendations says, uh, with regards to interns, yes, we can use interns. But for myself, and I think for Kiribati and for Tuvalu, we don't just want to use interns from Yale. We want to use interns from home, because that's building capacity for ourselves. The UN missions are prized grounds for development, for capacity building. And so this is practical terms for those nations amongst us now who have an extra dollar to spare. If you want to help us, you can actually do that by putting that dollar as a your ODA contribution to Palau to open a position for an intern to come from home to learn about international diplomacy and the works, international work. From home, that builds capacity for us. It builds capacity for, for the whole nation. And it's your ODA, as opposed to giving the ODA to another agency to administer for us. You can do it straight away. Um, and we would appreciate that very much. And my, my friend from Kiribati says, yes, thank you. So. <laughs> And in terms of, uh, and I wanted to, uh, in terms of the directory, not just the directory for personnel, but the directory for what's available in terms of expertise and the experts who are available, from which mission, and when can they help you. I'm talking about I have to draft all of my interventions, and so I have to say if if somebody can help draft some of the interventions as a framework of the things that we would like to say, and then I can refine it to make sure that it uh, presents the Palau position. Um, but many instances, we have to work very hard for those of us who are um, one or two. So late to sleep, early to rise. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. That was really, really helpful and specific. Uh, I'm going to ask Andrea later to take up the point about the numbers. What is a small state? Because she deals with that at the beginning of the report. But much more important, I would love to hear from those of you in the audience. If you would simply raise your hand, uh, a microphone will come to you. And uh, very good in the back. 
And if you would, um, it would be helpful if you would stand up and please identify yourself. Sure. Name is Harvey Dupitan, and I'm here again at IPI. Uh, great job, IPI. Uh, Ambassador, I commend you for the, this, this initiative. Uh, and I would really like to see this initiative uh, don't, does not end up as uh, many, uh, in other words, nowhere. The reason I say that is because I have been at the UN, uh, on UN grounds for the last 20 years uh, as a member of a small state. I am from Haiti. And so I have this perfect, unique opportunity to see the UN from a very different perspective. Because there is a tendency, and, and I've seen member states come and go, and, and when all that they have left behind is uh, something that really doesn't make any difference for the country. And then and, and, and turning to the big, big ideas that small states have spearheaded at the UN, I mean, let's look at them. We have the ATT, you have the ICC, you have Security Council. Those are, while they are sexy, very sexy issues, but there's a tendency to follow things that are sexy at the UN but, and not necessarily things that really matter. So there is an opportunity, uh, Ambassador, to take this initiative to somewhere, to, do, to, to, to a common, to something of common ground that these states share. And there is, there is not, and some ideas came actually from Ms. Fox, who, who, who actually addressed some of the area of priorities. She mentioned brain drain as one, she mentioned market access as another, and, uh, and, and a third. So there are some very good ideas uh, that could really provide a basis for uh, this uh, action that you are seeking, Ambassador. Uh, just, uh, again, a viewpoint from someone from civil society. Thanks. Jim, could I ask you to respond to that, since the speakers seem to be speaking to you? The, the point is, the, the points indeed are very well made. Uh, perhaps just picking up immediately on the <clears throat> desirability of um, of focusing on particular issues and not just the sexy ones, and I think I think that's that's well made. It would be very easy to pick the high-profile issues, the ones that get the headlines, as being those which you might want to talk about. But the reality is that it's the it's the nuts and bolts of UN business that re really are uh, important to individual missions and particularly small ones, and um, that's why, for instance, we chose um, the SDGs, uh, the the open work, the work of the Open Working Group on SDGs, as a a, a test bed, as it were, for uh, the briefing sessions we've held late last year and early this year. Before each of the major sessions of the Open Working Group, we've we've brought together the um, the re relevant UN people. Uh, and small states and said, here is a briefing on, on what the issues are that are going to be discussed over the next week or two within the Open Working Group. And that uh, has been extraordinarily valuable. I know that in some cases, the first opportunity that some, of the, some missions had to give any thought to these issues was when they sat down at the table and opened the papers and started to listen to the briefing. And that's the reality we all face. And that brings us, I think, to this other point of prioritisation, which Caleb uh, <coughs> rightly picked up on. If you're a big mission, you look at the journal in the morning and you say, who's going to go where? If you're a small mission, you're, you look at the journal every morning and you say, where are we going to go? In other words, which one, which of this list of things are we going to choose to do? And that is the difference. And prioritization is important for, 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 for virtually every one of us. Uh, you've got to be pretty big before you can cover the, cover the, cover the, the, um, the whole uh, um, field, as it were. So really, just coming back to your two points. First of all, it, it, you've got to choose the issues that people really are going to be working on for briefing sessions and the like. And secondly, we all have to prioritize. Uh, look, the, the issue of Security Council reform absolutely epitomizes the, the point that's been made in the report and which I made in my presentation. And that is that small states cover the whole diversity, in policy terms, small states cover the whole diversity of the United Nations. There will be those who, who agree with the G4 and, and simply support the G4's position. There will be those who, who belong to ACT, the, the, um, the uh, group wanting to refer, reform working methods. There will be those who support the intermediate solution, which is roughly the position uh, in which New Zealand finds itself. And there will be those who belong to the UFC, which basically says that uh, only change can be achieved by, uh, by consensus of UN members. So it, 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 it is the epitome of, but not, certainly not the only example, of a UN policy issue where being a small state uh, doesn't determine which position you actually uh, belong to. But I think there's, there's two things that small states would definitely agree on. 
The first is, is that the Security Council is opaque, it lacks transparency, and its working methods are, are, are locked in, in an era when the P5 uh, not only dominated, but believed that they had the right to dominate, uh, and that reform is definitely needed there, and improvement is definitely needed there. And the second thing that I think small states would agree on is that if there is to be some sort of structural change to the Security Council, in whatever way it takes place, but obviously that would inevitably mean some sort of expansion of, um, of membership, that should not be at the expense of those small states that do aspire to Security Council membership. We have Luxembourg on the Council now, population of what, around 500,000 thereabouts. Uh, Malta has, uh, has previously served on the Council uh, and, and other countries like them. The, my, my point is that I think that small states would all say, if you are going to give emerging powers a greater role, and most people think they should have it, um, if you are going to give emerging powers some sort of greater role, it should not be at the expense of small states. Thank you. Uh, I have three questions. We're going to start with Ambassador David Donahue of Ireland. Uh, if you just wait for the uh, microphone, and then two, and then three. And panel will take all three questions at once, if you would listen. Uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much. First of all, um, uh, congratulations to New Zealand for an excellent uh, initiative. Congratulations to Andrea for an extremely well-written report, which I think is it's concise, it's practical, and it will be the reference work in this area, I think, for quite some time to come. My point is, is simply, it, it, forgive me for not having read the document uh, entirely yet, uh, but uh, it may be that this idea is already there, Andrea, I'm not sure, but I certainly would be open to the idea of a mentoring arrangement involving a large, let's say, a slightly larger member of the group of small countries. I'm thinking of, let's, for example, Ireland. I would be open to the idea of a country like mine mentoring, if that isn't, if that is the right word, perhaps one can find a slightly less uh, sort of top-down one, but partnering a very small member of the same group. And uh, by that I mean as much the practical work uh, which we've been talking about here, uh, literally finding one's way around the UN, around the UN system, uh, and particularly when a, a handover has taken place. Uh, I think in that slightly vulnerable period when a tiny mission is without uh, its full complement, it might just be of some assistance to know that a telephone call or an email down the road, there is a, a friendly, slightly larger mission which can help them. But also, I mean, I, I hesitate to say uh, policy cooperation, but since the Ambassador of Palau raised an idea which had been on my mind as well, I could certainly imagine that we would help with what I might call basic drafting points for a potential intervention. I mean, clearly it's for the member state itself to decide how it wants to intervene on, say, biodiversity or whatever it might happen to be. Uh, but it might be possible for the same friendly mission to provide just some very basic introductory material which would get them on their way, as it were. And, uh, um, because, frankly, we've all been there. Uh, I mean, uh, mine is a small country, but we used to be, uh, in, in personnel terms, considerably smaller, so we all know what it's like to be in a two-person mission. So that's really where I'm coming from. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And then in the second row, the third row there. Thank you. Uh, you know, where I come from, uh, we usually uh, get uh, Paramount chiefs to speak first, <laughs> and then the, the smaller chiefs to talk last. Can I ask you just to introduce you for the sake of the webcast? Just to introduce yourself, please. Uh, I, I'm not from Palau, but I'm from uh, one of the diplomats from Tuvalu. <laughs> uh, I have to thank uh, everybody, uh, uh, Jim and uh, IPI and Sullivan and our friend from OHLR LLS. Did I say it right? For the presentation, and uh, my my issues is not really questions, but uh, comments. I think uh, when we did the eleventh uh, rounds for the SDGs, uh, you will have noted that some of the small island states or small island development states were mentioning that within the targets, the the seats are not really mentioned under the smaller targets. It's always about LDCs. 
I think in the UN there is a tendency to be focusing on LDCs, but not the other, you know, uh, vulnerable groups like SIDS. Although we have uh, an office which says LDCs, LLDCs, and SIDS, but SIDS is missing in the in the goals in in there. Uh, secondly, uh, I think one of the successes that we I note in the, that was not mentioned is most of the graduating countries are SIDS countries. That, that is something to say that they must be doing something right. Uh, apart from all the LDCs, which you know number close to 50, uh, I think six or five of the six graduating are from SIDS countries. So they must be doing something right that we have to uh, note. Um, my friend from Palau also mentioned uh, the fact that we, uh, and also uh, uh, His Excellency Jim, uh, about some of these countries are really new countries. You know, we are even younger than the UN, and we are, some of us are being graduated <laughs> that fast. And we, we have to take note of that. And, and the note about cooperation, uh, we all know in the UN, cooperation doesn't guarantee uh, agreement. You know, although we have, you know, for us, we, we even fight among ourselves to structure our statements so that, you know, it, it fits everybody. So it, it doesn't guarantee agreement. Uh, finally, uh, there is a, a note about uh, having two diplomats. I think in my case, the next diplomat is my wife. Now, how hard is that to, <laughs> to, you know, to live in the UN system with your wife? Uh, you have battles in, in work time and then at home, and that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. And then finally, the last question will be sure. this gentleman here on the aisle. Uh, thank you. My name is Khan Ross. I run a thing called Independent Diplomat, which is a non-profit which advises small countries and uh, non-state actors uh, who are excluded or marginalized in diplomatic institutions, including the UN. And um, uh, the point, uh, two points. First of all, congratulations. This is an extraordinarily important I issue. I've been concerned about it for a very long time, ever since, in fact, I was a P5 diplomat on the UN Security Council. Since then, I've attended the UN Security Council in no less, I think, than five different delegations and have been appalled and um, shocked at the injustice of the way small countries and non-state actors are treated in that place. And this is the point, question I want to make, which is about the Security Council, this preeminent organ of the United Nations, which I think embodies these injustices in the most acute manner. I followed the debate on working methods and Security Council reform now for many years. I was part of the Council and saw how working methods were actually embodied and practiced. The m approach of the S5 and then now the ACT group in terms of uh, proposing draft GA resolutions, asking for consultations, papers from the Security Council, is I think going to be ineffective because the truth is the P5 doesn't want to listen. I'm not quite sure how many P5 ambassadors there are here today or even uh, diplomats from the P5. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but the truth is they're not listening. Uh, they run that place and they like the way they run it and they use various different techniques on how to run it and exclude people. And if anybody wants to um, invite me, I have a little talk called Secrets of the P5 about how they, <laughs> what a racket that place is. But I want to put on the table two rather radical ideas, which I don't know if they're included in your paper, which I look forward to reading. One is that the small countries should gather together before the Security Council elections and form a platform about what the small countries are going to do once they become non-permanent members. Because the truth is the P5 get away with it because nobody stands up to them. The rules of procedure of the Security Council are not uh, written in stone. It's not the Bible or the Quran. They're just informal rules that are made up as the P5 go along in the heads of the legal advisors of the P5 missions. They can be stood up to. I've seen it happen in the old days when Slovenia, Brazil, and um, Canada formed a little triumvirate to stand up against the P5 and changed the way the council discussed Iraq, formed working groups, included others. It can be done, but the trouble is most of the non-permanent members, in fact, not all of 
rather all of them, and I don't want to be rude, don't stand up to the, uh, to the P5 these days. They just accept as if it's a kind of ancient liturgy, the rules of procedure as laid down by the P5, and they don't question them. And they're overwhelmed by the proliferating processes of the council, the subcommittees, the uh, open meetings, which are, in truth are not about transparency. They're about fobbing off the non-permanence and the rest of the mem membership with things that appear to be openness, but in fact are not. My second radical suggestion is that given the absolute resistance of the P5 to change anything on the Security Council. I think that the ACT countries, and indeed all small countries who demand that they be included in discussions of resolutions that are about them, that they consider boycotting the non-permanent elections in the autumn at the General Assembly or indeed that they consider boycotting formal meetings of the Security Council as an act of protest and as an act of non-collaboration, non-cooperation with these deeply unjust practices. I've watched this issue for 14 years now. These demands for reform, these GA resolutions have made no difference. Things have got worse. The small countries and those who really care about this issue need to consider radical solutions. I'd be glad to help. Thanks very much. We've got five minutes, and I'm going to reverse the order of how we spoke at first and ask Heidi if you would answer, say whatever you want to say and base those questions. Andrea, second, and we'll give Jim McClay the last word. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the questions and comments. Uh, um, uh, I'll start with the, uh, with the suggestion of mentoring uh, arrangements uh, by the Ambassador of Ireland. I think this is very good. I know uh, from my previous work as Finland that there are some countries that take uh, diplomats from smaller nations into their delegations. And this has even been tried to imp be implemented in Security Council, but I know that there has been some difficulty with that. Uh, but uh, I know of, of these type of uh, arrangements have existed. I think mentoring is, is very, very good, very, uh, very important, and could be used much, much more. Um, on our friend uh, from the SIDS, um, uh, your comments were very important. You mentioned that, um, that you feel that there is more focus on the least developed countries than the SIDS in the, in the open working group. This is, of course, again, um, something that the member states themselves must make sure that their priorities are taken on board. And uh, I can only speak from my office's point of view. Of course, our mandate is a little bit different when it comes to the least developed and the small island developing state, whereas least developed, we are uh, mandated to help them in the implementation of their program of action. So we are very actively uh, organizing different events for them to make sure that they um, are knowledgeable uh, about the issues and the topics. And of course, many of the SIDS ILDCs as well. So through that, they are participating in this. For SIDS, our mandate is more of an advocacy uh, 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 mandate. So we are trying to uh, manage with that. and uh, and talking about small resources, our SIDS, re SIDS unit is extremely small. Uh, one of our people sits here and the other one is in the office and that's it. So, so um, it, it's about small resources for us as well. And yes, graduating countries, many of them are SIDS. That is something that certainly uh, we can be very, very proud of. But at the same time, it's important to remember that these countries remain very vulnerable. Uh, so. Uh, we have to make uh, sure that we do everything we can to, ma to make the transition from and the graduating process as smooth as possible. Um, and on the last point of, uh, of the P5, I can only say that um, the colleague uh, who told me uh, that he couldn't imagine of being uh, from such an insignificant country as Finland was one of the, uh, the P5. So, um, uh, you know, yes, uh, I agree. They don't always understand or, or listen to the concerns of the small countries. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So if I, peer, peer learning, which we could call it, did come up throughout these meetings. The idea of sort of PR or DPR partnerships, um, of sharing drafting points. And one specific idea that came up to that end was which one of the interveners here sort of raised as well, developing a directory of 
which missions have which expertise, since we've discussed how they have niche areas. And on top of that, which missions would be willing to take calls or emails where they could quickly disperse some advice in particular areas. Um, but just as an example, how you said there, I'd be happy if my mission and my country did this. I mean, that has happened at every meeting and every interview that we did, where small state ambassadors are saying, we have these resources, we have this expertise, we're willing to share it. And two specific examples is one state has candidacy software where, that helps with the elections process and tracking. Another state has software for their treaty reporting, um, where it has a form from year to year and you don't have to duplicate all of that work the next year. And those countries have said, we're very happy to share these tools. What's missing is a central hub to do that. Um, whether that's online actual sharing or a message board where that can happen. So we've started to explore in the report what that platform would be, because there's so many ideas, but we need a platform that has buy-in from many small states in order to sort of facilitate that exchange. Um, and I just want to say on the Security Council, this passion and this has a very intense issue and one which deserves a very large project of its own was one that we sort of had that regard to. So we acknowledged it, talked to people about it, but also didn't want this project to turn into small states and the Security Council, which I think is a valid project of its own. Thank you. Jim, the last word. Thank you, Warren, and thank you to everyone. I'll, I'll try and be uh, uh, quite brief about this. Let me start with picking up on something that Heidi spoke about in her first comments, and that related to the groups coming together to work together, and it relates to the que leads me into the question uh, asked by Costa Rica. Um, I, I always found that the best committee I ever sat on was a committee of one. It was always unanimous. It reached its conclusions very quickly, and it didn't argue at all. Um, the reality, however, at the United Nations is a little different. You can't do anything without others. That, that is the experience. And that's why we have blocks, that's why we have G77, and that's why we have, have um, uh, CARICOM and, and, and a whole range of other groups that speak uh, or endeavor to speak with, with one voice. Uh, but working together is, is, is a complicated process. It requires resources, it requires application of effort, it requires that you all get together in the same place at the same time. Uh, and that alone is a, is a, is a drain on the, re the resources of a, of a one or a two person uh, mission at the United Nations. And therefore this, this idea of sharing information and mentoring I think uh, could be extraordinarily valuable. Uh, just on the issue of, of draft uh, talking points, you know, or perhaps the outline, draft outlines might be a better way to describe it. I've been rather interested to watch the way in which these troikas have been working in the context of the SDG Open Working Group. Some of them, of course, are formalized within the working group itself, and others are just groups that have come together to, to talk about the same issues in much the same way. And I'm wondering with that, whether that might be showing us an ex a practical experience, because a lot of small states have been involved in these, in these, these troika uh, arrangements. I wonder if that's actually helped point us in a direction uh, that we might go. Um, can, can I just say to Costa Rica, I won't, I won't develop the point at all. I agree with you entirely about the role that NGOs, the positive and useful role that NGOs can play, not just in this organization, but in a bilateral context right across the board, a multilateral context right across the board. Com coming to the two points that were raised about the Security Council, absolutely no doubt that the, the P5 runs it as, it, as, uh, as it's effectively its personal fiefdom. Nothing brings the P5 together quicker or more effectively than some threat to their privileges. And we saw that with the S5 resolution. I won't develop the point any further. We suffered from it in 1945 when the Secretary of State walked into the, the, the meeting. The only issue that went to the vote was the veto. Everything else was agreed by consensus. He walked into the meeting, looked at my Prime Minister and said, no veto, no United Nations. He got a reply, which I will not relate in polite company. Um, look, there, there, are, there are many ways in which, which uh, um, states whose affairs are being discussed by the United Nations or who have an, an interest in it, uh, the, uh, whose affairs are being discussed by the Security Council or who have an interest in it can, can become involved. Now, the, the council at short itself should give them an audience. If you're on the agenda, if you're on the menu, you should be at least at the table, in my view. But if that isn't happening, there is nothing to stop individual member states, and this is where the power of the elected 10 does become real, 
There's nothing to stop member states doing their own consultations. We believe that in 1994, April 1994, we were better informed about what was happening in Rwanda than the Security Council itself. Why? Because one, the Secretary General of the day withheld a critical report that should have gone to the Council. And secondly, um, we went out and we talked with with civil society, the people who were on the ground, the relief organizations. We talked with African states who were around and knew what was happening in the, happening there. We, we talked with all sorts of interest groups. We were better informed as a result. And that is a, there's a, a way in which non-permanent members of the council can function right now. They don't need any uh, new rules. They don't need any cooperation from the P5. They can just go out and do their own thing. I come to your second point, your suggestion about, and I've got to be very careful how I answer this one, your suggestion that, that uh, the ultimate protest would be a boycott of the elections. That simply gives it over to the ones who, um, who vote. That to me, bo boycotting elections, whether it be in any form of democracy, simply hands, hands the, the levers of power to those who, um, who most exercise them. The reality is that if you, that the most effective way of making the council within its existing structures, work within its existing structures, is for non-permanent members to function effectively in their role. Uh, and you know, I can cite, cite you many such examples, not, not, not simply our own, but many others besides. You mentioned one, just one such example. The short point is that there are powers there. Uh, uh, they're effectively capable of being exercised. The important thing is that they be exercised. Thank you, Jim. Uh, the, there are many more of these reports in the back. I've been watching people put them in the rack, so please take one as you leave. Uh, you've heard me say enough about it, but it's a terrific report, something that IPI is very proud of. I'm very happy that New Zealand asked us to work with them on it. And I thank the panel in particular for your, and you for your attention. Thank you.